Welcome everyone to Bergstrom Mahler AACG Wisconsin Artists Series. My name is Casey Ihorn. I am the curator of collections and exhibitions here at Bergstrom Mahler Museum in Nina, Wisconsin. And tonight we are very fortunate to have with us Sheboygan artist Beth Whitman as part of this wonderful series um, sponsored by the Art Alliance for Contemporary Glass. Um, for those of you who have had an opportunity to participate in previous programs, you know that we've had several different methods for delivering this program. Obviously, we've had to all pivot a bit here with regards to the COVID situation right now. And so I know many of you uh, maybe participated in person with Wes Hunting or on a Zoom call with several other artists like we're doing this evening. We even, as part of this series, have done some pre-recorded videos with several artists and you may have also had an opportunity to see them present. Uh, but this evening, we have joining us uh, from her Sheboygan Falls home out in the country, uh, Beth Littman. And Beth is truly a, a wonderful friend of the museum. She has prepared for you this evening, a, really a terrific presentation. We had an opportunity to meet yesterday afternoon just to make sure that all of our, our ducks were in a row before today's presentation. I do wanna let you know that there's a chance that with all Zoom calls, there's a chance that we could have a, an internet hiccup or whatnot. If that happens this evening, you know, please uh, stand by with us. We'll jump right back into the call as quickly as possible. Um, I just want to make you aware that that's always a possibility. I'm sure that most of you um, have experienced that uh, in the past. Also want to make you aware that this presentation is being recorded. We will post this to our museum YouTube page as well as the museum website, and that will be available this coming Monday. Just to make you aware in case you're not able uh, to stay with us the entire evening or if you want to be able to share this presentation uh, with your friends, we would absolutely love for you to do so. Again, it will be posted to the museum website and the museum YouTube page on Monday. Uh, before we get started as well, I do want to encourage you as Beth is speaking this evening, and Beth has a slideshow that she'll be presenting alongside of her, present, her, uh, her speech. I would like to ask you to come up with some questions if you think of questions for Beth this evening. We would absolutely love to have them. I will moderate those questions and we'll answer the questions in a group at the end of the presentation this evening. Um, I, I may talk with Beth during the presentation itself if something comes up. Uh, but we'll add all those questions to the end. We'll do our very best to get to every one of those questions. Um, we'll just, we'll see how many we get submitted, of course. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Beth Littman. I would give you a round of applause, but it's just me here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. Okay. Thank you, Casey. Um, and I am going to share my screen with you. So we'll just get this keyed up. And Okay. Can everyone see that front page again? Yes? Good. All right. Great. Just give me one second here. Um, okay. So I'd first like to acknowledge that this visit is being held on the traditional lands of the Chippewa, the Potawatomi, the Ottawa, Winnebago, and Menominee people, and I pay my respect to elders both past and present. And I also want to thank the Bergstrom Muller Museum and the Art Alliance of Contemporary Glass for sponsoring this lecture. So, um, we begin. So my work um, primarily uses the tradition of still life to explore parallels and disparities between different points in time in history and juxtaposes those different periods of time with our current time, our current epoch. Um, and, and so this is, this is actually the first still life that I created in 2000. It was a response 
to Severin Rosen's Still Life with Fruit at, at the Brooklyn Museum. And um, the piece on the right is, is actually in their collection now. Um, and, and since that time, I have found more and more compelling reasons <laughs> to continue to engage in exploring this tradition. Still Life um, first was really contextualized in the Netherlands in the 17th century and kind of late 16th century. And it was really the first time in, uh, in the Western European tradition that, that inanimate objects kind of came to the foreground in their depiction and the figure completely disappeared from painting. So up until this point, um, objects were really supportive to a narrative that was primarily held by, um, you know, a, a figurative interaction within paintings. And then at that point in time, this is kind of fascinating, of course, some of us know it, at least previously as the Dutch golden era. It was also the first time in, in history that food became um, a commodity. There was an abundance of food and other um, kind of creature comforts. And so it was the, you know, really the first moment where it wasn't this, this dire need to um, consume food just purely for survival, that it, it was something that uh, became representative of something, of something greater that had been achieved in society. So it was a time of extreme wealth, um, as I mentioned, time of surplus. And, and the still life reflected that at that time. It also talked um, very kind of subtly, but maybe not so subtly to, to, the, to the viewers at that time about medicinal applications, theological um, symbolism was also included, um, as well as kind of this economic, um, like, like really um, the, the peak of economic kind of um, wealth and status within the community. So as you can see here on the right, this is really a classic depiction of a Vanitas still life, a Harlem style Vanitas still life from that period of time. But still lives have been really utilized throughout history in, in different ways. So for instance, this is a theorem painting on the left-hand side, which is essentially uh, a painting that was made probably by a young woman to beautify their home. And it was, a, it was a, um, an acceptable way that women in the 19th century in America could explore their creativity with a lot of structure, of course, around that. So there's just a lot of different ways to unpack this, this very long and storied tradition. And the other thing I'd like to just point out is that it's really grounded in potential belief systems as well, which come up in my work over and over again. So um, you're, you're being asked to believe that all of the objects could perch that precariously on the table um, in that way and that all of those objects might be might be available at any given time to you um, in the marketplace or that you could you could really take ownership of those things so in some ways um, this tradition is really about wishful thinking too and fantasy which might not be something that you immediately think of today because there's so much that is available, right? Um, so I really started the still life tradition thinking about that, that moment, that, that golden moment in the Dutch era and juxtaposing it with like late capitalism and that was really in the early O's. And from there, um, within a period of years, I started to depart thinking about it as purely an economic display. And I started really thinking about these objects from almost like a material culture standpoint that they all are um, really symbolic of 
of an individual or a society um, or perhaps an institution. And um, this is one of the works that I created in that, that vein, which, which I think of as portraiture just as much as still life. Um, it's called One in Others. It's from the Norton Museum, the Norton Museum of Art, and it's a composite portrait of um, Richard Hone, who happens to be buried underneath the Norton Museum of Art, um, myself, and then um, you know aspects of the permanent collection from the Norton Museum. So there's there's parts of the pineapple plant that are kind of an, an, anatomically depicted on top of what is hard to see here, but is actually a casket that uh, could hold my my body. It's it's built to my my dimensions. So um, that is a good example of that. My work also started to address the larger um, kind of environment that you might find still life paintings. So I really think a lot about a domesticated environment and how by extension, the objects that we surround ourselves by within our own home are also reflective of us as individuals and the society that we're in. And even, you know, in the late Victorian era, there was um, a direct correlation between the objects that you would find in your home and uh, your ability to be um, pious and, and close, to, uh, close to God and close to Jesus at that time. So there was like literally this direct correlation, which I think may still exist to some extent, but thankfully is also um, dissipated a fair, a fair amount. So, so throughout the history of, of, um, of kind of adorning our, our homes, you know, that history is also fraught with all of this information and all of these belief systems. This piece is called After You're Gone and it um, is an installation at the RISD Museum of Art in 2008. And the, the wallpaper on the walls was uh, uh, referencing the wallpaper in their collection. The portraits are, are empty and there's a, a glass settee that's recessed into that archway that's directly related to um, the Pendleton House, which is a part of their museum. And it's actually one of the first period rooms that was ever installed in the United States. And I, I often think about period rooms in my work and these kind of artificial constructs that exist within the museum, but are really specific to individuals' perspectives of what creates a home and what is, you know, you can't see me on quote unquote correctness of, um, you know, what an interior might look like. And I, I use that kind of metaphorically through my work as well. Um, so simultaneously, not only thinking about domesticated spaces, but actually the furniture that inhabits those spaces. This is called Sideboard with Blue China. And for a while, I took a nice deep dive into um, the sideboard and all of its symbolism. Um, there's a great book called Death in the Dining Room by Kenneth Ames, if, if you're interested in this particular piece of furniture. But the sideboard um, really connotes the, it's a, it's a ceremonial piece of furniture that actually uh, kind of connotes like the success of the hunt and the the wealth of the the family that has the sideboard the the actual functionality of most sideboards is quite limited actually <laughs> like the, sh the 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 drawers are quite shallow and the shelving is quite shallow it's really a performative uh, kind of piece of furniture so I took this notion of this piece of furniture being a place where the the man historically would come and carve uh, the bird or carve the meat and, and provide for their family. And I, I turned it a little bit on its head and I created an altar that um, has different components of the human body 
in, uh, in the panels that create the piece of furniture. So you'll find in this piece of furniture, um, male and female genitalia, brains, lungs, hands, feet. Um, you'll find symbolism such as snakes, eggs, dogs, which are a sign of, of loyalty, fidelity. Um, and it, so it's really, it's really thinking about this, this understanding of, of um, almost like the consumption of the body in a weird way. And also like the way that the body can be carved apart and, and also uh, consumed in, a, in kind of a metaphorical way. Um, and the, the, the title refers to a quote by Oscar Wilde um, that was basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, I find it harder and harder every day to live up to my blue china. <laughs> so that's that. The work also, so here's another piece that involves furniture and the symbolism of furniture within space. This is actually situated at the Ringling Museum of Art in Sarasota in this image in the old Astor Library, um, which is, is a shell of the library. It's actually not, uh, it's, it's not set as a period room. In fact, it's, it's almost a walkthrough space, but it was really ideal for this installation. So in fact, as a viewer, you would approach margin for error, which is this piece from the back of that crib on the left-hand side, and then you would um, pass it and you'd be confronted by this um, adult shaker cradle for rocking the moribund. So this piece is very much about time, which is also deeply in the tradition of still life and the transience of life. And um, I don't know if you can actually see, but the crib is actually sinking into its plinth behind it. So it's a partial uh, crib. And then you're faced with this adult cradle. Um, in 2000, 13, I was given the opportunity to do a residency at the Smithsonian. They have a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, and I took a deep dive into um, the Natural History Museum there. And I was looking specifically for a new vocabulary that could begin to incorporate the dialogue of climate change and our, you know, our kind of um, moment that we find ourselves in in this age. And, and initially I was thinking about trying to find um, information, visual information about what the flora looked like during the last age of global warming in the Earth's history. And when I, <laughs> when I talked to the paleobiologist that I was working with, and he showed me the leaf structure and the leaves of the, the actual fossils from that last stage. They looked kind of like the leaves that I would find in my backyard. So I, I quickly understood that um, I needed to find a language that was a little bit more overt and something that people, or at least many people would think of as prehistoric to start to um, to start to prompt people to think about the different epochs and the way that, um, you know, life on this earth has, has been lost and also has, um, has uh, perpetuated over time. So I, uh, I started researching greatly uh, prehistoric flora that, that looks visually similar to where to what we have today. So there's certain things that we all consider as ancient. And um, you'll see here in In Earth, which is at the Museum of Wisconsin Art, um, a cycad tree, which looks very much like a palmetto tree, but is um, different. It's, it's not a flowering um, tree. 
And so anything that flowers, and I, I apologize if you already know this, but anything that flowers is actually a, a relatively new addition to, to life on this earth. And so there's ferns, moss, lichen, uh, cycads, um, conifers. These are trees that have survived uh, five, extinction epochs, most of them, in the Earth cycle. And I found that to be really heartening, <laughs> in, a, in a way. So the work started, uh, the work started using the table as, as literally a timetable, and it became a vertical timetable that you could read, uh, you know, that, and maybe think about in terms of cultural objects, in relation to humans and prehistoric and existing flora and, and their juxtaposition to each other um, and, and how, where, you know, what that says about the time that we're in to date. And I just want to point out in this image actually that that's Carl von Mars painting in the background, which is called the flagellants, which is actually about the plague in the 1300s. Um, so it's just a really wonderful juxtaposition, I think, in this particular space. Um, so, so I started creating all this work that really started bringing landscape in and thinking about landscape and thinking about flora um, and in, in relation to these cultural objects. And I also have created photographs. Uh, here are two of them. This is from a series called Alone in the Wilderness where I juxtaposed um, objects as surrogates for individuals. I almost think about these as portraits, still lives and landscapes together um, where they are kind of witnessing this wilderness. And just, just if you wanna geek out with me for one minute, the image on the right, those are like little horsehair ferns and they're some of the very first ferns that come back after wildfires. They're also ancient. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, um, so a couple of years ago, I was, I was able to do a residency at Kohler as well, where I, I live four miles from Kohler, but we'll get into that in a minute. And um, I started working very in a very small way with cast iron and brass and I, I used um, miniature architectural details and miniature um, cultural objects and I juxtaposed them with the ancient flora within these uh, dioramas that are, a lot of them are actually made out of um, Amazon boxes. These two are not that you happen to see here, <laughs> but they're, uh, I, I started, amassing Amazon boxes and creating vignettes. These are called distills. And the actual, and so I'd cast them in resin bonded sand and the actual act of pouring the molten metal into the mold would destroy the objects and also finish them at the same time. So here are four. And, um, you know, they're quite small. This one on the bottom left-hand side is, is maybe 17 inches wide. So they're, they're, they're all working kind of from the same concept, but in a different way. This piece is a nice segue. It's called Laid Timetable with Cycad, and you can see the Cycads once again kind of piercing up through the 16-foot table. Um, this is actually the first piece that I created after that residency. And it will be on view at um, the Museum of Art and Design starting next week in my solo exhibition there called Collective Elegy. Um, so it's, it is, um, it's now in their permanent collection. And I have to say this pandemic has been, besides terrifying and uh, difficult on many levels, it has given me a new appreciation for installing virtually. <laughs> so we're going on our fourth week of installation where I am literally um, FaceTiming the entire 
exhibition installation with the team there, and they've been really magnificent. Another work that will be on view in Collective Elegy on the third floor of the Museum of Art and Design is this piece, which is called House Album. And House Album is a selective portrait of the United States that explores issues surrounding agency, identity, and memory. It's actually, I'm gonna show you another picture here. It's, well, no, we'll go back. <laughs> it's um, two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. It's vinyl and glass and metal. And um, this was inspired by, you guessed it, period rooms for one. And secondly, um, the tradition of Victorian scrapbooking of miniature houses. And that particular tradition, which you may not be as familiar with, was a way that young women and girls um, and some older women could process the information that was coming to them in droves. And I really think about this as like the pre-digital revolution. There's a lot of parallels between information onslaught at that time and the information, the way we receive information now um, in this, a, this digital age that we're living in. And I find that really fascinating. So at that time, it was one of the first times where there were a lot of print advertisements um, that would, would basically bombard the households and, and show um, primarily women by that point, how, what, what would be possible in terms of decorating their homes. And um, this tradition, basically, they would cut these advertisements out and start to craft their own ideal of what a home might look like with all of these individual objects. So um, I took both of those traditions and I, I really thought about this allegory of our collective home. And the, um, I really wanted to process, I started working on this about four years ago and I needed to, it might have been pr actually prior to the election, but I really wanted to represent um, certain individuals and events that I felt were significant for one reason or another in uh, the United, in our collective history in the United States. So I started doing a, a, a tremendous amount of research, primarily online, but also um, on site in some cases. May find in an interior space and create our collective home. Casey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we lost you for just a minute there, Beth, but I think we, I think we have you back again. Back. All right. Do you want me to repeat what I just said? Yeah, if you don't mind, maybe the last 30 seconds, that would be great. <laughs> this is a test just to see if I can remember what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, um, what did I say? You were, you were just jumping <laughs> off. <laughs> um, basically, I, again, did you lose me again? We, we are kind of getting, we have you coming in and out here for just a minute. I apologize. Okay. Okay. The hamsters are not working. <laughs> um, all right, I'll try again. Um, anyway, it took, it took many uh, years and it's actually still in process, but I, um, I had to find objects that you may find in an interior space that are representative of individuals and events in the United States history. And, and so it was quite tricky because actually there are some individuals and events that I still was not able to find certain objects to incorporate into this piece, which is called House Album. Here's a detail of it going in at the Museum of Art and Design from yesterday. Um, but I did manage to um, create a, a room that is our 
our my ideal room it's really about my it's really my ideal room um, but it's not I, I see it as an ongoing project a living piece that can continue to change over time and incorporate more and more objects as I find them so um, house album brand new hot off the presses um, I'll just mention some of the objects that you're seeing in this particular image. The mother's quilt that is on the wall is actually, um, it's one of the patches from the AIDS quilt. Um, so that's that. And then the, those windows to the left are from the Barton house who Clara Barton actually founded the Red Cross. Um, and the settee that's sitting right underneath it is 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 actually in Ruth Adler Schnee's home, and she is a very renowned textile designer um, from the from the sixties, the fifties and sixties, who designed for Herman Miller among other um, companies. So all of these objects that you see here are from different points of time in in our history and i i invite you to take a look there'll be a video shortly about it as well um another thing that's happening because everything has to happen right at the same time <laughs> is in a very masked fashion social distancing visiting the new art preserve building which is um, a new building of the John Michael Kohler Art Center. Um, and it, it will hold their permanent collection, primarily of environment builders. And um, they invited me to create a washroom, which is a longstanding tradition for the John Michael Kohler Art Center to commission artists made washrooms. And they so have created a called Wild Matter which is actually the common name for uh, this plant that you see on the bottom left-hand corner. Um, so wild matter is, um, it connects the understanding of preservation, which Art Preserve is obviously about preserving these works of art that might actually have been lost. They're primarily by self-taught, artists um, and are very ephemeral and were really discovered in one way or another and then preserved. So I wanted to extend this idea of preservation to uh, like a hyper locality of the environment around us. And um, the whole washroom illustrates central Wisconsin's natural surroundings through its flora you know, during this radical transitional time of climate change. So um, it depicts over 1,200 different species of flora found in Sheboygan County. And um, I sourced all the imagery with help from the Wisconsin Consortium of Flora website. And um, I, I, so most of the images, almost all the images have been crowdsourced. Um, so every single tile on every wall, six walls in the washroom is different and unique and represents this flora. And then I don't know here, we'll see. So when you go into the, here, this is literally an image from yesterday. <laughs> Also, <laughs> no joke, all happening at the time. So I, I've been working on this project uh, 2018 as well. You can see this is actually the, uh, this is the west wall on the floor in the upper left-hand corner. And then this is the east wall grouted. Um, and we're actually standing inside where the stalls will be. You can see the toilet footprint there. Um, and then when you walk into the stalls, 
there'll be small vignettes that that relatively small these tiles are 11 by 17 inches and they gently start to kind of illuminate and become available it's a privacy switch glass and and these tiles that you're seeing are actually slip cast clay renderings of a 3d model of three specimen sheets from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Herbarium's collection. And these particular specimens are either extinct or extirpated from this area now. So that's happening. And then the last thing I'd like to just share with you is that in a very short time, um, on November 5th, in fact, there will be another exhibition opening at Nora Jaime Gallery on West 21st Street in New York City. And I just wanted to share with you three pieces, three brand new pieces that will be on view during that exhibition, which is called Every Last Thing. This is called Northern Monkshood Composition. And Northern Monkshood is actually also an endangered plant, but it is also toxic to humans. This is scale and gazing ball. Um, what you can't see is those kind of orbs, those big black orbs on the left side pierce down through the table. You can kind of see it on the bottom right hand side image as well. This is called all in all and it's actually a relatively low table it's about an uh, a 20 inch high table almost coffee table height and then the uh, flora um, grows on the top of the table and it is i think it's 90 inches long or maybe it's 112 something like that it's and it's about seven feet tall as well um okay so I just want to talk to you about my studio. We, Casey and I discussed me walking around with my phone in the studio and we just thought the connection might give out. So even though I am sitting in my studio, which you will see shortly, I'm just going to show you images of the studio so that we know you can see it. So this this is the this is my property. I live in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin, which is just west of Kohler and Sheboygan, um, ten miles uh, away from Lake Michigan. The 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 studio space is about ten paces from my house, which is that big white building behind the house that you see here. Um, the space, this is kind of the larger general space that I work in. The space is used for a lot of kind of conceptual problem solving. I also build all of the compositions here, but I don't always make all of the components in this space, but it's really a thinking space that I'm in pretty much every day. Um, I have a little small hot shop that I use for prototyping and making small components. And I have a, a cold shop as well um, for fabricating as well as other uh, you know, pieces of equipment. But I do want to mention that I work with teams often, and I also work very often. And that has really allowed in my vocabulary and, and uh, really you know, fabricate the work as it needs to be made. Um, <laughs> that's Kohler's sign. So I've been in and out of the Kohler factory and Kohler company for, well, since 2003. Did you lose me again, Casey? We, we lost you for just a minute. I think you were just mentioning that you, your work with teams and the importance of that in your, in your process. Um, but then we, we got you back when you started talking about Kohler. Okay, great. So I was just saying on the left is just an image of me working with the Museum of Glass, um, Gabe at the Museum of, of Glass. And then 
So I do work with others often to create components in my work. I also work with Stephanie Trenchard and Jeremy Popelka occasionally in Door County, who I just adore. They're phenomenal artists. Um, and I really am quite inspired by their practice as well. Um, so what I'm working on in my studio right now, while all of these other installations are kind of happening around me, is I'm working on a commission for the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. And it's a response piece, which I've, I did not show you a lot of my response work um, in, in this studio tour, but I, I do have a, a pretty long history with responding directly to individuals or institutions, and I really love working in that way. So I um, am working with this portrait of Abigail Levy Franks, who was um, a very prominent um, matriarch in uh, colonial America. She lived in New Amsterdam in the 1600s and 1700s. And uh, her father and husband were merchant marines. So the, the commission that I am doing, the sculpture I'm doing is called Belongings. And I'm making a traveling trunk that investigates issues of immigration and assimilation and, and power and agency. So, which are all concepts that are rooted in the founding of the United States. So it's, you know, it's very much within the same, um, like, uh, concerns that I've been working with, with House Album as well as some of the other work that I've done. So the luggage is actually going to hold objects that represent aspects of her life, her family's life, and their, um, their, uh, their companies. And those objects will also represent this collective narrative that continues on in this, in this country. And the work will primarily be concealed in the trunk. You will only see the objects through the, the trunk. And the trunk will be lit from underneath. And the only area that will be um, um, open is actually the keyhole in the luggage trunk. So um, yeah, and that will be on view in 2021 when I finish it. You, you see some of the objects uh, that might be included on the upper right hand corner there as well. That's a cow cow pod and also an iron collar for chattel on that upper. And I'm also making some, some of the objects in clay and red clay. So it's, they may, they may, uh, the, you know, it's really going to be about the silhouette and the opacity of those objects and the interplay between the transparent and the, the opaque and what you can see and what is concealed from you. So I, that, that really concludes my portion of the talk tonight i can stop sharing i think that <laughs> we're just gonna oh yeah so we're, we're gonna, gonna try <laughs> how's that yeah. and we had a couple really fantastic questions and i think we have enough time for them beth great um, i i did have a quick question that actually just popped up in the in the chat rather than the q a and since it directly directly relates to the the traveling trunk piece i just wanted to ask it um amy um Morefield, our, our new executive director here at the museum, she asked if people are going to be able to look through the, the keyhole on the piece. I was kind of curious about that myself, or will they be able to get that close um, to the piece necessarily? I am hoping you'll be able to get that close. I mean, the, the trunk will be on, it'll be on a, a low plinth um, on, the, on the floor. Sure. Um, and it it really depends. I think the plinth may be built so that there's um, like 18 to 20 inches um, from the start of the trunk to the edge of the plinth. So I'm hoping that there'll be some people on their hands and knees trying to peer into that keyhole. <laughs> um, 
and there there most certainly will not you will not be able to get all the information of what's of what's inside of course the museum staff you know always someone knows what's in the traveling trunk but right. <laughs> it won't necessarily be available as traveling trunks are not <laughs> so it sounds as if that's part of the the allure to the piece as well at least from from your your perspective based on how you spoke about the piece well i think it's an interesting time casey because we expect to get all the information don't we we expect to have everything provided and we never get all the information you know and um we certainly do have very little information historically about many things <laughs> so one of the reasons that we know so much about abigail levy franks is that she was a writer she wasn't a writer like writing novels but she wrote very extensive letters to her son who was abroad um, in the uk where they had originally immigrated from and those letters were saved and and it's one of the only accounts of that time uh, pre the founding of the United States that we have that records what it was like to live at that time. And she also, they were one of the only predominant Jewish families in New Amsterdam. And, and so a lot of the information is also about her her anxiety around assimilation and um and in fact her her grandchildren all assimil all um abandoned that particular faith um by the you know so that, that it was lost so it's, i think that these things are really really interesting concerns that are just absolutely very current concerns in our um in our our collective dialogue here so i think i think all that information you know once again thinking about these objects as surrogates for the individual or the collective or the body so in some ways for me it's it also harkens back to the sideboard um, it also really relates to the weissman art museum piece that i made that is a chest of drawers that is a reference to marston hartley's uh, painting and also his his own life and his life story. So I really furniture has a long and storied history of of you know relating to the human body, even the the vocabulary used to describe certain aspects of furniture relate to the human body. So it's really a natural. I'm just going off on a tangent now. I'm sorry. No, because I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, I, yeah. I love that you're going on that tangent because I think it directly relates to another one of the questions that we had. Um, Great. Diane Mullen, just towards the beginning of the conversation, uh, she asks, can you speak to how your work addresses and enriches the idea of memorialization? Um, so I, I think that that kind of jumps in uh, with regards to talking about um, to talking about not only Abigail Levy Franks but other other individuals' yeah. stories. Yeah, they. I mean, they are reliquaries in some ways. I mean, they're they're artificial reliquaries, right? They're not. They're alluding to this act of of um, kind of holding sacred. Um, but in, instead of having actual sacred um, objects, they're, they're really about the ideas or the story of it in some ways. So, um, and I think that the quality of the materials that I'm using are very much about that as well. This, this kind of ephemeral, um, elusive, and precious quality of, of glass in particular really, for me, does memorialize, you know? Um, it really, it, I don't know. I'm curious if Diane agrees with me or not on that. <laughs> but even like the cat, you know, like the cast iron pieces become these 
you know, they're very much about these little um, moments of fossilization, you know, so th this kind of memorial, like sometimes funeral quality, funereal, I'm not saying the word right, but you know, th it's all, it's the materials really conjure those things for me. Great. Um, Bruce and Judy Bendoff have a question here. Uh, pertaining to the the mad show um, and I'll just read the whole thing here they said what um, what gorgeous amazing work thank you Beth is there any chance do you know um, if Matt is going to show this particular exhibition virtually um, perhaps later have you have you heard any whisperings of that or um, I will I hope so um, I think that, so they're opening today. This is their first day that they're reopening. Um, and I believe that they will most likely find ways to engage the viewer online as much as possible, given, given what the circumstances are. They, I know they are at limited capacity of, you know, you have to make reservations to go in, uh, but you won't be crowded. <laughs> In the, in the space. So um, yeah, not exactly 100% sure, but I would imagine that they are probably gonna be working on that. And the show will be on view until April. Okay. So, yeah. I, I can certainly understand and appreciate what it's like to, to arrange a show in this time. Um, I can't imagine necessarily your perspective on you know, trying to install a show that you know, I believe when we spoke yesterday, uh, one of the shows that you were speaking of had a, a two-week installation window and actually went um, as long as four weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't remember which, because I know you have several things happening and I can't remember which is which, but um, I, I can't necessarily imagine what it's like not to be able to be um, next to your work um, when that's something that you're you know, very much accustomed to. I, I don't imagine that it's been particularly often that you've not been um, on site, especially with the assemblage nature uh, mm -hmm. of your pieces. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, how, challenge, how challenging that's been? Have yeah. you been working over Zoom with, with curators or? How yes, it's been, it's been kind of remarkable and, and in some ways really empowering, I have to say, because, uh, because of the quarantine in New York and my, um, my schedule, I, it was just decided that it would be best that I, that I install virtually with FaceTime. So I've been working with a team anywhere from seven, you know, five to seven people pretty much for four, four weeks. And um, I, there was a fair amount, I had a fair amount of trepidation. I can only imagine <laughs> that they did as well. But it's been amazing and really inspiring to know that, um, that it can be done. I have installed virtually smaller works before, you know, medium-sized pieces, but nothing to the extent of this. And um, I think the really wonderful thing for me also was just to see how they really took ownership over the process. Um, and really, you know, by the end of the install of the largest piece, yeah, they were just like, we got this, <laughs> we got it. And that, so it is possible. And in fact, many institutions that, that do own the work, they, they install the work without me and then send me a picture maybe sometimes afterwards, you know, like, hey, look what's up. And that's really wonderful because, you know, the work does have a margin built in that is interpretive. Sure. And so I find that to be really interesting to see how the piece continues to live. It's like a living drawing, a living three-dimensional drawing. So every time that a work is installed it's a little different it's not static and that can be really exciting um if you're me 
about to say <laughs> if you're someone else, it may not be exciting, but but it, it worked out. I I think I'm I'm overjoyed that 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 it happened, you know, and now I know that we can do it. And I think that that is something that we're all learning, that there's things that we did, could not imagine living in a different way or doing something in a different way. And out of necessity during this time, we have had to reinvent ourselves to figure out how to live. And, and some of that information is worth keeping, I think. Absolutely. I, I can certainly appreciate, you know, my side of things. You know, I, I was involved with installing a rather large piece of, of Joyce Scott's that, you know, it, it really, it really morphed every place that it went. Um, and so I, I can definitely see, especially with your larger um, assemblages, I can see that it would be challenging to, to mimic, even at the same institution, uh, on a separate installation schedule of, you know, the exact way that it was set up previously, if it was moved. So I can, I can certainly appreciate that. We have about five minutes left, Beth, and I do have a couple other questions that I'd like to get here too. Um, I had an anonymous attendee um, ask, um, well, I'll read the whole question here. It says, I love that your work is multimedia. Um, how do you decide what medium to use for specific pieces or within specific pieces? Um, and I'm curious about that, maybe as it pertains specifically to the washroom installation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, as I remember it, and, and I had an opportunity to see that piece of well, and thank you very much, by the way, I was able to visit uh, Beth at, at Kohler and see the piece as it was being uh, put together. Um, and I understand that some of those pieces are ceramic tiles, and then a small number of them are also glass tiles. But can you speak to that question a little bit about how you decide on medium and sure, sure. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I I would say it's changed over time, but I initially I I had a I was super focused on working in fibers actually and and glass. And that that's those are the disciplines that I went to school for at Tyler School of Art Temple University. Um, so I think like there's just so much information that you can get from a material and the process that you use to create things in that material. And um, so I have this tendency of working in, a, in an accumulative way. You might have noticed that. <laughs> so, so that is a way that I can build very large moments with very small things. And that happens to also be something that you might do if you're weaving, for instance, with one thread back and forth, um, or um, when you're blowing components. And, and so I, I have this tendency to think about building in that way. I certainly feel continually inspired by the materials that I'm working with for their inherent qualities and also for their history. Um, I find that to be really quite uh, compelling. And then I also feel like sometimes it's a circumstantial thing, like the, the washroom tiles at Kohler, I knew very well that part of that particular commission was me going into the factory and working in the pottery and creating those particular tiles within within that context that's that that's the nature of that project and i had worked in the pottery before so it was an easy way for me to think about building and making um, and then i and then in terms of incorporating glass tiles which you're correct a third of the tiles in each wall are glass and what i was um, intending was this kind of undulating that would happen so that all of the flora imagery was not just on the surface, which is, it's a, it's a permanently fused decal on the surface, but the glass tiles that I created in my studio and also had printed at Skyline Design in Chicago, the image is recessed. So it, it is something that creates movement and rhythm 
in that work so that it's not all very frontal in that way. So I think, you know, I am, I use process conceptually also. And, and so a lot of the decisions are around, you know, moving that communication uh, between me and the, the viewer through those materials if that's helpful. Like, I don't, I don't know how else I would create the trunk, for instance, belongings. Sure. It has to be in glass, obviously. Right. So I think in the material, but I also have lately started thinking in clay and wood and the connotations around that and the way that you can work in those materials. The last piece that I showed you that will be on view at Nora Jaime Gallery in November, all in all, had actually a, a lot of clay in that work as well. So um, it's starting to, you know, shift and change, and that's exciting too. Do you think that some of that is a is a response to your participation in the arts industry program? Do you think that any of that has to do with that at Kohler? Or I know we didn't really get a chance to talk about it, and we're kind of at the yeah. end. Of our our yeah. time this evening, but do you think that that has something to do with that that shift or? I do, I do. I've, I've done several residencies at the John Michael Kohler Art Center's Arts Industry Program, and it's in fact why I'm in this area, because I also worked for the Art Center for a period of years. Um, and I think that that familiarity with those processes and those materials is inspiring. And so then I just start to think in that way as well. So I am very, uh, I, I am, the work is research-based in terms of how my direction goes within the work, but the materials are definitely a part of the way that the work is manifested and it's through kind of my love affair of those processes and also just thinking about the metaphors that are inherent in the process of making them like the like the the whole the whole thing with glass for instance is just you know it it has a lifespan it is a metaphor for life it can crack it can break it can heal it can fuse and heal um it can transform you know and all of these things are very natural kind of life cycle issues that I think are just so latent in the finished work. Like they're really in there. If you start to really think about that, the power of something that's cracked, the power of something that is uh, not perfect alongside something that is perceived as perfect. All of these things start to connote very powerful kind of uh, philosophical questions for me. Sure. Um, you know, we, we had a, a bunch of other questions on here, but I do try to keep the, uh, the program to an hour in respect of your time and, and folks understanding that the program is an hour long. So there are some other great questions on here and I may even um, at some point send you these questions just out of curiosity because there's a few here that I'd love to have the answers for but we are out of time this evening um, I do want to say thank you again Beth for agreeing to participate in this program uh, for being such a wonderful friend to the museum uh, we we very much appreciate you uh, we very much appreciate the work that you are doing um, and you know we wish you all the best in, in your continued endeavors I know that this is a crazy, crazy time right now with, you know, three installations going on, all what they seem like simultaneously, essentially, and your willingness to come on and, and participate as a part of this AACG Wisconsin Artist Series. Um, it's, it's very much appreciated um, from us at the museum. Uh, I, I thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Thank you for coming, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this evening's presentation with Beth Blitman. Uh, we will be posting about our upcoming AACG Wisconsin Artist Series presentations on the museum's website and the museum's Facebook page early next week. So please stay tuned and thank you again for attending this evening. Thank you, Beth.
Thank you. Good night. Good night.